5 p.m. in Kiev, and we could start our last lecture of uh, the Arbitration Academy of the Ukrainian Arbitration Association. And uh, this is a very interesting topic, technology and arbitration. And uh, today we have not one, but two speakers, uh, which uh, I'm sure will make our lecture is even more interactive and interesting. And so uh, our first speaker is Professor Doc Dr. Maxi Sherrill. He is special counsel at Wilmer Hale uh, Litigation and Controversy Department in London. He also serves as a professor at Queen Mary University of London, where she holds the chair of international arbitration, dispute resolution, and multi law. And uh, she holds the position of Queen Mary's director of the Center for Commercial Law Studies in Paris. She is also a general editor of the Kluver jo uh, Journal of International Arbitration, and she uh, uh, and has acted as a visiting professor in numerous universities. It would be <laughs> very, very long to name them all. Uh, and she uh, is just one of the most reputable and famous arbitrators. And uh, I am very happy that she has accepted our invitation and uh, to... to uh, uh, deliver this lecture. And uh, the second speaker is her colleague, uh, Russell uh, Cheldry, uh, who is an associate at the same law firm in the same department, uh, and uh, um, uh, has uh, uh, experience in um, commercial, uh, international commercial and treaty based arbitration across a range of institutions, including. ICC, AAA, uh, the CIA, LCA, and the NICSI. And uh, he was also a deputy editor of proceedings of the American branch of the International Law Association previously. So, uh, I, without further ado, I will give you the floor. Just a, um, a, a, a small comment. So, uh, our um, participants uh, have uh, could uh, send you some questions in the chat box. They could raise a hand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's up to you whether you would like to have questions uh, in the end or during the presentation. So if if the, uh, you would like to have some questions in between, you just invite the, the audience to react, and that's it. Uh, otherwise, we could have a separate Q and A session Q and A session in the end. So in total, we have uh, two hours for everything. Uh, and so the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Olena, and thanks for everyone for coming. I know it's quite late uh, in Kiev uh, where you are. Um, it's our pleasure, uh, Brussels and I, to join you for this last session. I didn't realize it was your last session um, in this Arbitration Academy and, and show our support uh, for what is um, uh, your country and uh, the Ukrainian Arbitration Association. Um, so the topic of today's session is technology uh, and arbitration, and it's a topic that's very dear to my heart. Um, I think it's probably the most important topic um, of our times in international arbitration. And I got interested in uh, technology and, and artificial intelligence years and years and years ago um, uh, when I was preparing for keynote in Vienna. Um, and it was about uh, international arbitration and artificial intelligence. And I realized that, you know, my career as an arbitrator, but also as a professor will just so much change in the years to come that, um, you know, uh, it, it is really a topic that we need to be very careful about to think together. And that's what we want to do today with you. And so we actually want this session to be as interactive as possible. So we get we have a couple of slides where we are going to ask you questions, reactions. Um, so you can hopefully either do that through the chat or, um, you know, just really, you know, unmiking your unmuting your microphone and, and speaking up. I'm sure um, it's a you know, small enough crowd so that we can we can handle that uh, you can raise your hand whatever whatever you feel most comfortable but uh, 
we want you to feel um, that it can be as interactive as possible. And if, if at any moment you have questions or comments, um, please do uh, chime in. We, we would welcome that very much so. Um, so for today's lecture, the idea on what we want to do is really sort of give a practical overview of where technology and arbitration intersect. And, and we think the best in doing that is, is as follows, and you have here the overview slide. Um, we want to briefly define technology and international arbitration and then take a long view and give you an overview of the, the various shifts in technology that, that have happened in the past are happening in the present. Um, and we want to do that as well in looking at some very practical tools, very specific, you know, apps and things that we see um, being used in international uh, arbitration. Um, and that goes through the various different life cycles and phases of an arbitration from a case preparation, from selecting an arbitrator, gathering evidence, um, to preparing for a remote hearing or drafting an award. So we're going to look at all of that um, and where specific, you know, types of technology um, can be used in order to enhance, hopefully, efficiency and transparency and accessibility. But we also want to think about the challenges and, you know, potential risks that these technology tools and AI um, bring with them. And this includes question of data privacy. It includes questions of security concerns. But also more generally um, um, on where is arbitration, sorry, where is artificial intelligence leading us um, in this whole um, venture? And this is also very much where I want to, I'm interested in, in everyone's, um, in everyone's uh, comments and, and feedback. Um, so with that, actually, I would like to sort of get a first sense of your, you know, reaction and temperature. Um, and here's here's our first sort of question to you. What do you consider an important technological development that will impact international arbitration in the years to come? And what do you think the impact is? Just a couple of ideas. If you want to just go ahead and shout out a couple of them. Who wants to? Don't be shy. I'm looking at the chat as well, but feel free to speak up if you if you wanted to. Any technology that you think is going to be in use in arbitration in the years to come? Yes, Sagi. Hello. Uh, well, uh, in, in view of uh, organizational issues related to international arbitration, uh, I'm sure that all distance technology will 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 uh, heavily influence um, the conduct of arbitration, the relations between arbitrators, between arbitrator and party, between party and witnesses, experts, uh, and so on. So uh, I'm sure that uh, this uh, trend to to be on distance uh, will will con will continue to be uh, actual and uh, will develop. Uh, in relation to uh, activities of arbitrators, I also believe that uh, this uh, trend to use of artificial intelligence uh, will develop. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that someday uh, uh, artificial intelligence will propose maybe not, not an award, but at least a uh, draft uh, of uh, an award uh, based on... Uh, based on uh, hearings, uh, written submissions, and so on. So I feel that it, it, we are very close to this uh, to this stage. Excellent. I still hope that I'm, you know, I will live old enough to see that, uh, to have an assistant, uh, AI assistant, who can help me draft awards. But that's definitely one aspect. So thank you so much, uh, Sergey, for, for your comments. Um, and in terms of the online or remote or video hearings, this is also something that various other people have mentioned in the chat. Um, and of course, you know, just as much as we would love to be in Kiev to see you all 
or in other places in Ukraine, um, see you all for this lecture, but we can only do this remotely uh, for the time being. And um, just as well for hearings, of course, we continue to do some parts of the hearings remotely, and we're going to talk about that quite a bit as well later on during the during the lecture. Um, and then a couple other people mentioned artificial intelligence generally, and maybe some new uh, aspects of artificial intelligence. And I hope again, um, that we can discuss some of the very specific um, effects of these various tools um, together during the lecture. But uh, this was just sort of a, a little warm up for all of us. So if we now look at the definition and hand over, and I'm gonna hand over to Russell for that. Thank you, Maxi, and it's really a, uh, an honor to be before all of you today. So we wanted to start by grounding ourselves with the basic tech um, definition of technology, because doing so really allows us to recognize the myriad of ways that technology affects international arbitration beyond just the most popular examples, many of which we will discuss today. AI is, of course, um, something that's on the top of mind for, for everyone, and I think rightfully so, because it sort of does spark the imagination about um, what effects technology can have on arbitration um, that, that are really exciting to think through. So for, for, for a basic definition, the Cambridge Dictionary defines technology as the practical use of scientific discoveries. And I think that's a fair definition. We will, we're going to use it today in a bit more of a broader sense. And we mean the use of various digital tools, platforms, and processes to enhance the efficiency, transparency, and effectiveness of international arbitration proceedings. And of course, there are numerous ways that technology has impacted arbitration, and we will address many of the most prominent examples today. Some of those uh, examples have the potential to, or already are, making a radical impact on the practice of international arbitration. Others are probably not quite as radical, but are nonetheless important changes um, and developments that every practitioner should be mindful of so that we can determine whether a technology should be adopted or perhaps even you might have to object to a technology being adopted in a particular arbitration. Um, so with that basic definition in mind, uh, we wanted to then proceed to talking about um, and providing a very basic overview of the evolution of technology and arbitration. And I'm going to do that because I'm the older one between the two of us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the idea here is to say we're going to talk about the present and the future in a moment, but it's also quite nice to sort of think about where we've come from. And I am old enough to actually have typed in my legal studies some of my, you know, work um, on a typewriter. If I tell my students that, they don't believe me. They look at me and say, no, you can't be that old. But yes, that is true. And similarly, I, I remember, you know, going to the fax machine and, and taking faxes, um, which of course today no one else does anymore. So within, you know, a couple of decades, um, technology has changed the way we practice already quite significantly. Um, and of course, the pace of technology is such that it is um, exponential. And so just the pace of how it changes will be even greater going forward. So that's why um, taking this long view of where we come from is also quite significant. It explains why a lot of lawyers are skeptical um, and quite conservative. When you talk to them, they will say, oh, no, this is not going to change much in our, you know, the way we do our job. It's going to be a bit, you know, it's going to be changed a little bit here and there. And I think they're they're wrong. I think it will significantly change the way we practice just as much as, you know, today um, typing something on a typewriter you you think that's just you know nonsense no you know no one who's alive today would have ever done that so of course you know replacing some of these manual processes that existed paper faxes etc is is um, an in person hearing is something that has come uh, uh, gradually um, in the sphere and in the landscape of of arbitration but um 
it has uh, certainly you know, helped uh, the fact that, for instance, we had a, a COVID pandemic recently and where we were forced to adapt some of the technological tools, for instance, for um, remote hearings. Um, and really, when you think about the COVID uh, pandemic, you, many of you, I, I suppose, um, have had uh, similar experiences. There was a lot of pushback uh, from people around the world regarding these advances on technology. They thought it wouldn't be possible to have these Zoom meetings. But they also needed to just learn how to work with these um, with these tools. But, you know, this is sort of an evolution uh, where we have, you know, had, of course, um, you know, digitalization, electronic evidence, and then the rise of remote hearing as it is here um, on, um, on uh, the, the sort of long view that we take here on, on, the, um, on the slide. Um, just maybe the last point, um, this is sort of moving closer to where we are today, is the integration of AI and data analytics. A lot of that has already happened. We sometimes don't necessarily know where AI is used uh, when we use our emails or when we use our research tools um, or even a simple Google search. Um, uh, of course, it includes a certain number, a certain machine learning and therefore artificial intelligence, but even more specifically for arbitration when it comes to legal research or document analysis or predictive tools for legal outcomes. Um, this is already today uh, what is happening, and this is what we want to talk about um, uh, with you today by going through various specific tools um, that you can use um, in your in your practice as international arbitration uh, lawyers. And I'm handing back over to Russells for uh, talking now about these uh, some of these very specific applications. Thank you, Maxi. So with, with that very helpful um, overview of where we were and where we are now in mind, uh, like Maxi said, we wanted to walk through some of the most common applications um, of technology and arbitration. And we've divided those um, applications up, um, as you can see here on the slide. And so we wanted to start first with the way that technology impacts legal research analysis and writing. And we wanted to start there because many of the technologies that are available today are actually the ones that affect the practice of international arbitration the most on a day-to-day -day basis. These are the sort of things that you're likely to encounter in the, in the day in, day out practice of being, um, being in this field. So of course, for research, websites such as Clue Arbitration, Hein Online, Global Arbitration Review, GAR, as it's also often referred to for shorthand in our field, Jusmondi are online repositories of a huge amount of books, academic articles, um, ar arbitral awards, and, and much, much more. These websites are regularly relied on um, when performing legal research for briefs, um, when those with a more academic bent, people like Maxi who are writing and drafting articles that are, you know, true thought leaders in the field. This is obviously, these are resources that are relied on heavily for that because they make identifying relevant resources easier and faster than ever. There are also resources that are available directly from many arbitral institutions. Um, the ICC, the uh, ICSID, um, UNCITRAL all have online libraries um, that contain really helpful uh, commentaries on arbitration rules, the underlying treaties themselves, model laws, and much more. Of course, one unique aspect about arbitration as opposed to um, your run-of-the-mill court litigation before national courts is that the parties often have the opportunity to select their own tribunal. In arbitration, usually the only scenario where you would not is if there was an appointing authority at an institution. But because the parties play such an important role in choosing the tribunal, a critical part of that process is the initial selection and nomination um, of finding the right arbitrator for the job. And so, quote unquote, arbitrator diligence is a critical part of our practice. And that sort of diligence involves research to ensure that the arbitrator has the requisite background to be an effective decision maker, 
um, that the arbitrator doesn't have any conflicts of interest that would preclude them from serving on the panel. And a lot of tools have developed in recent years that are particularly helpful for um, practitioners doing the most effective research on those issues. So Juice Mundi, GAR, all have um, arbitrator databases that allow you to quickly identify um, whether an arbitrator has recently worked with a um, particular counsel um, or law firm where an arbitrator might have um, might be a member of. So you can see in the middle an example there of where I've I've entered Maxie's name into GAR, and there are are several of her most recent um, appointments that appear there on the slide. Jusmundi has a conflict checker, and you're actually able to, I, again, I could have typed Maxie's name in, and then there would have been results showing whether she had connections to particular individuals, firms, or even states, if you're involved in um, an investor state dispute. So th those are really powerful tools to help streamline arbitrator diligence. And there's also, the LCIA has a challenge database, so if if you were to get to the point in a case where you wanted to challenge um, an arbitrator, that is one of the more um, useful publicly available resources from any institution. And then of course, when it comes to, let me see if I can get to the next slide. For legal research itself, um, this continues to be highly jurisdiction specific in the US and UK. Westlaw and Lexis are two of the most uh, powerful resources that are available. Um, there's very well-developed databases for cases, statutes, and, and so on and so forth. Um, otherwise, though, legal research remains largely jurisdiction-specific. But with that said, the hot-button issue of late has, of course, been the potential for JET to use ChatGPT or other AI services for legal research. And given the ability for AI to process much more information and in much in a much quicker fashion than humans are capable of, I think it's fair to say that there is great potential. Um, I've, I've used it myself a, occasionally, not for actual legal research, because um, for issues that I think we'll get into in a second, but before doing that, we were actually interested to hear from you. Should And so the question we wanted to ask you, similar format before, is should lawyers rely on AI? If so, what tasks can AI be trusted to perform for lawyers? And while people think about it, let me let me quickly comment uh, on a couple of things um, that, that Russell just went through. And, and, and we we want your answers to this question. Um, but but sort of in terms of um, legal research, I think there's one important aspect, which is probably a lot of people will say, you know, that is not really technology or AI, because, you know, at the end of the day, this is just, you know, database where I get information from. But in fact, it makes a huge difference as to how good the, the research and search function is. Um, sometimes you can enter in a question and you get some prompts which articles you want to read. Um, sometimes you have to be very specific in how you link different terms to get something out of the database. So the way the search function works is very much AI um, driven. And what I would also say is that I can, it, I don't, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't exist yet, but I can definitely see in the future that these um, databases, research databases, will be combined by very powerful translation tools so that we can read legal research in languages that is not necessarily language that we speak, right? Um, I would love to be able to read uh, articles in Ukrainian or Spanish or God knows what else, um, but unfortunately I can't. But because the translation part of AI has become so powerful, um, and, and maybe we can talk about that later. Um, if, if this is going to be combined, I'm going to click on an article that one of you has written in a language that I don't necessarily speak. And on the next screen, I will have a translation of it immediately. 
as far as I know, that doesn't exist yet, but that is a poss possible additional tool for research. The other comment I wanted to make about the arbitrator platforms is that, of course, they're all paying fees. They're, they're fee-paying based uh, platforms. So if you haven't taken a, a, a subscription, unfortunately, they're they're not available for free use. And that is one of the big downsides because the idea, of course, is that the more information can be shared about arbitrators, the better, so that you have a transparency about that. But because it's only fee based, um, it only applies for you know a certain number of law firms and individuals who are able to subscribe to those platforms. But if you had a chance to look at those platforms, it's absolutely mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing the information that is on there. I could not believe the information that is on there. What you know concerning me. Um, awards that I thought were confidential um, commercial awards are on there. If somewhere around in the world it, the award has been, you know, presented to a court for set aside, which hasn't happened, um, rather enforcement and recognition proceedings, um, it, it probably is somewhere on a public uh, docket in that national court. And use Mundi is able and is allowed to use it. It's not that they're doing dodgy stuff and sort of looking at, you know, getting documents they shouldn't be getting out there. It is absolutely mind blowing. Um, so I really am surprised every time I look at it. The other, and this is my final comment, is that a lot of people I think aren't aware how powerful these tools are. Um, because even in, you know, when I have discussions, for instance, with um, counsel who contact me to be appointed for an arbitrator position, or if I contact a chairperson, for instance, um, a lot of people don't know that information is out there on their connection with other people. So I always check my own sites um, to make sure that I don't miss a disclosure. Of course, I have, you know, my own firm's conflict database who will tell me you know, what is what I need to disclose, but I always double check what is out there in the public domain um, just to make sure I don't miss anything and my firm hasn't missed anything. So these these arbitrator platforms are really quite um, quite powerful, I have to say. Now, coming back to Russell's question, sorry, this was a long-winded comment, apologies. Um, should we actually rely on AI and for what? What can be the tasks that AI can be trusted to perform? What do you think? Yes, Sophia. Um, hi, everyone. Um, from my personal experience, I can say that AI is not developed in that way that we could rely fully on that. Even if we can give some legal research to some AI platforms, I think we still as a lawyer should uh, double check and clarify. Uh, for example, there is an AI Harvey uh, launched by AINO and uh, sometimes it could create a case which not exists. So you basically can ask like, hey, do you have any case law regarding this question? And you will receive an answer like, yeah, we have it. And there is like, it's like completely, good looking case with the uh, name of the parties, with everything, all the details. And then when you try to Google it, you realize it's, it just not exist. It was created by AI. And the same could be with the legal research when you're just asking basic question about something in law, you can also receive an answer which is not completely true uh, or it was like created by AI. So I, I, think, yeah. I, I think, yeah, for now we still should double check everything, but sometimes it can also give a right answer. Very good, very good answer and very good question and comment. And we, we're gonna come back to all of that in, in the coming slides, but it's always good to have, you know, that sort of sanity check at a minimum to sort of think, is this right? Let me let me see. And Google search might be one thing and, and um, you know, just multiplying sources, um, cross-checking your different sources is also a good thing. Anyone else? 
Svetlana said in the chat that search for information or summarize text. And um, there's actually a very good example as well on Use Mundi, where you can now ask for long investment arbitration awards to be summarized. And you can say, I want this to be, I don't know, 10 or 100 characters long, and I want this to be longer. And then you, uh, it's AI. Uh, based. Um, there is a summary that is written as you look um, of the award um, that is 250 pages or so long. Um, I've I've tried it a couple of times. I don't think it replaces reading an award and looking for what you're looking for, but it can be a good first sort of step into um, what you want. Proofreading texts and making emails sound better. Yes, that's ChatGPT, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in in a second. That's that's very good indeed. Um, I'm a notoriously bad proofreader, and I can only can only be my proofreading can only be enhanced. Uh, Valeri says the closer disclosure procedure at least level one disclosure. Uh, I think if we're talking about e-disclosure, Russell's is going to come back to that um, also um, in a second. So excellent, uh, excellent thoughts. Um, so a couple of, and, and you're absolutely right, of course, all that you need to have a, you know, some uh, natural reluctancy when you use AI. And this is for a number of reasons. First of all, and this is really important to remind ourselves of all the time is you cannot put confidential information into um, public uh, AI apps such as ChatGPT or other uh, LLMs as they're called, uh, uh, large language models. Because the information you put in, if you ask a question or a text, is then in the public domain. So if this is confidential information uh, from your clients, um, from your cases as arbitrators, you cannot use um, the public and normal AI apps. There are of course ways around. Um, if you, for instance, have a specific app that you know is only tailor-made for your firm, um, as Harvey, Harvey, the example um, that was just given, then you can use it for inf uh, confidential information as well, because there will be a protection level uh, included in there. Um, I mentioned earlier that in our firm, we use a, a translation, or uh, I mentioned that they're very good, powerful translation tools. And we, as a firm, have access to a translation tool that's AI-based, um, and because here it's a specific, you know, license, we can actually put in confidential information without it being, you know, uh, bleeded out uh, to anyone else. So if you want to translate, you know, part of your award or a document, you can just copy paste it in there. And the translations are, again, really mind-blowingly good. Um, sometimes not. You need to double check, but 99.9% .9 is, is correct. The other thing that one should keep in mind with ChatGPT is that it is, of course, based on public available information as well. And that means that if an information, an information is not publicly available, it won't make it into uh, ChatGPT. So there are gaps, there are blind spots for ChatGPT. And so when it comes to legal research, that is a very important limitation. There is also a limitation in time. So the you know free version of ChatGPT has a certain cutoff date. Um, and um, we also need to be mindful of that. So most recent information is not included in the at least the, the free version of, of chat um, GPT. And then um, as um, Sophia uh, already told us, there is this question of hallucinations where this is here on the slide where ChatGPT basically invents stuff that does not exist. And there are many examples. There's um, Michael Cohen, the former um, infamously uh, known um, for being Trump's lawyer. 
um, he used citations from ChatGPT that on regarding cases that simply didn't exist, and there are examples of other lawyers that have been fined for using ChatGPT, and you have here the, the parts on, on the slide. Now, what is important to understand that this is not just bad luck, you know, it's not like, oh, this is a fault somehow in ChatGPT. No, this is how ChatGPT works. That's the inherent way of ChatGPT, because what ChatGPT does is basically trying to find an answer that is probable in the sense of probabilistic, as in, you know, math probabilities, um, that is probable to be the right one. So if there is no case number, it will come up with a case number or reference that looks just about right, but isn't necessarily existing. So it's not just a fault in, in the program, it is an inherent feature uh, of how ChatGPT works. And again, it's a very powerful tool, but these hallucinations are, you know, exist and they're ingrained and systemic in how JetGPT um, works. Now, if we move to the next slide, this is um, again, oh, the, oh no, this is actually Russell having fun with JetGPT, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't miss this one. Um, so Russell actually asked JetGPT itself, you know, um, is ChatGPT reliable for legal research? And you can read you can read the answer here on the slide, and I find it absolutely fascinating. So it goes: while ChatGPT can provide general information and insights on various topics, including legal concepts and principle, it is essential to remember that it is not a substitute for professional legal advice or dedicated legal research tools. ChatGPT's responses are based on patterns in data and knowledge available up to its last cutting off date. That's actually the point that I've just mentioned, which was in January, 2022. It lacks the ability to access real-time legal databases, case law, or jurisdiction-specific regulations, which are crucial for comprehensive legal research and analysis. That's a bloody good answer um, uh, when it comes to legal research. But Russell's being a good cross-examiner, he actually went on and said, please give me a yes or no answer, right? You, if you cross-examine one, you don't want a long answer, you want a yes or no answer. And ChatGPT answered no. But because Russell is a really, really, really good cross-examiner, he then said, well, maybe there is a little bit of, you know, ambiguity here. And he said, no, as in you won't answer the question or, is the answer to the question no? And ChatGPT replied, the answer to the question, is ChatGPT reliable for legal research, is no. So now, without any doubt, under cross-examination, ChatGPT has admitted that it is not reliable um, as a, a legal uh, research tool. So that's for legal research. Um, and well done, Russell, on your cross-examination. Now we're going to look more into um, other aspects, and this is um, a drafting and, and, and filing of legal briefs. Um, so, I mean, we all know paper filings was the past, um, although I have to say, uh, when I try to put in my procedural orders, no more paper, I usually get a bit of pushback uh, from my co-arbitrators. I personally don't use paper anymore at all. So everything's um, um, electronic and I have a much happier life uh, since I've done that. There is the possibility for using e-briefs or e-bundles. And um, here is, is just the um, definition from uh, the ICC commission. Um, it has certainly become uh, increasingly common to use them. And what it means is that in your document, which is, for instance, your statement of claim, in the footnote, you will have your reference to your exhibit number and then a hyperlink that 
when you click on it, leads you not only to the correct document, but to the correct part of the document that is referenced. So if there is a, I don't know, a 250 page investment arbitration award, it will lead you to the specific paragraph um, in that 250 page award um, that is of interest and that has been cited in the in the um, in the e-brief. And if this is well done, you can actually then you know underline and comment the exhibit on your whatever tool you use. I you know I use iPad so I, I, I would sort of make my comments on it you know, underline it, write bullshit arguments, excuse me, I've never write that, but, uh, you know, something like that. Um, and the next time you click on the same link, it will also then, or another link to the same document, it will end again, open the document with your comments in it, as opposed to a blank a document. So it's, it's, it's also quite a good tool um, uh, to do so. You can also include video clips or audio recordings or any interactive graphics from from your experts so it, it, there are just a lot of possibilities with these e-briefs that don't exist on paper um and we see more and more of them now that also means that before the hearing very often once the parties have exchanged their submissions and all the exhibits, there's often also then a final hearing bundle in electronic form that is used for the hearing and that is provided to the arbitral tribunal. Now, I have to say, I find this sometimes problematic in the sense that sometimes in some cases, the e-bundle e for the hearing is provided to the arbitral tribunal, say, two weeks before the hearing. I have already done all my preparation works two weeks before the hearing. I've already, you know, read all the submissions as you go along. So having another bundle two weeks before the hearing, I don't find very helpful. And uh, specifically, if you have already underlined your documents, um, um, as I just mentioned, as you go along. But uh, this is my little personal uh, grievance with some of the electronic bundles. Um, on the next slide, we have how cases are in fact filed with the arbitrators and um, with the arbitration institutions. Um, you might be aware that most arbitration institutions now at least allow for electronic filing. Some actually even um, uh, impose it or at least uh, incentivize parties in doing so. So for instance, the rules of the London Court of International Arbitration, which are here on the right hand of your side of your slide, um, actually say that the initial request for arbitration and the response um, shall be submitted in electronic form uh, to the institution. And you have to actually ask for uh, permission and specific approval if you want to still do this in another format in paper or otherwise. There might be exceptional circumstances, but you need to get in touch with the institution to get an approval. Otherwise, it has to be um, electronic. And then you have more and more institutions that will have data sharing platforms. Here on the left-hand side is, is the example from the um, SEC, the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce Arbitration Institute, uh, where the parties, rather than sending stuff around by email or USB keys that, as it used to be in the old days, they you know every council um, deposits the submissions, the exhibits on this shared data platform. And even if they don't exist by the institutions, sometimes the parties just organize these data sharing platforms amongst themselves for the specific case between the law firms um, involved. Um, Exit has done this for ages. Uh, so they, they simply use Box, which is a sort of, you know, public or, you know, licensed uh, app. And so any Exit case is stored on the Box app and the arbitrators and the institution and council and everyone has access to the same to the same documents. Now 
I should say, but I, I'm not going to name any institution here, that some institutions have tried to implement these data sharing um, platforms, but haven't done so in a very you know, fortunate fashion. So there's one institution, I was an arbitrator, and they have this shared platform. And every single time someone loads up one document, um, you get an email that says so-and-so has uploaded a document. So imagine a submission where someone uploads, I don't know, thousands of exhibits. You get a lot of emails. And there is no easy way to turn that off. So I think that's a, yeah, I'm not going to say which institution that is, but it was definitely a, a real, you know, these guys haven't thought this through in terms of their technology. Um, now, this is all about, you know, storage of documents, how documents are filed. Um, but there are, of course, also, and this is the next slide, use of AI, how documents are actually crafted. If you want to draft a submission, uh, there are practical tools that can help you. Harvey is um, the one that Sophia mentioned earlier, which is um, it initially uh, something that is not specific to a particular law firm, but a &O has used Harvey or you know, said, we are going to develop together with Harvey a specific tool tailor-made for our arbitration practices around the world. And on this slide are you know, three questions that Harvey arguably um, is able to answer. Um, so if you put in, just using the last one, um, draft me a research memo uh, examining how the Supreme Court's Janus decision affects private sector unions. And then you get an answer um, in, in form of a memo, a research memo uh, from Harvey. Again, these are tools that are tailor-made, quite expensive uh, for specific law firm. There's also, and this is just another example of a tool, co-counsel, um, where you can put your own files, so the submissions, the exhibits, in that in in a in a shared folder and and um and that particular app, co-counsel. And so on on that app, you have all the exhibits and all the submissions, and then you can sort of ask question to co counsel a little bit, maybe as you would to a to a colleague or in a in a in a team, and you can say, oh, can you just check what is the date of whatever this market authorization? I've been dealing with market authorization recently in a in a pharma case, um, and then. Hopefully the answer comes, yes, exhibit C-157, it's the 15th of December. Um, and so this is developed on the basis of chat GBT like uh, models, which are these large language models, which are able to provide the information, but also provide it in a form that is intelligible and usable um, straight away. That's that's really the sort of paradigm shift of the the chat GPT um, uh, generation. I think um, earlier one of your comments was about e disclosure, and I think Russell's going to tell you a little bit more about that um, in the next slides. Yes, exactly. So we we wanted to talk about. Um, the way that technology has become increasingly important in international arbitration through its ability to help navigate the large amount of documents that practitioners can be um, faced with organizing and um, disclosing in an inter international arbitration. Um, th this is in many ways a, a result of the fact that more information is stored electronically than ever before. And that can, of course, present serious problem for practitioners in our field uh, because documents and evidence that is relevant to an arbitration can be stored in thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of documents. So to understand the ways that um, different technologies are used in that process, it, it's important to recognize that there are at least two times in a typical arbitration where the practitioner might be faced with a large number of documents. And the, the first time uh, is when one party requests the disclosure of certain documents from the counterparty. Um, in most arbitrations, there is a disclosure phase 
um, where this happens. And typically the way this works in practice is through the exchange of Redfern schedules. Um, I've, I've included one example here on the slide from an investment arbitration case. And this is a what the Redfern schedule looks like at the very end of the process. Um, and I just wanted to briefly walk through why that, that's important. So on the third column from the left, you actually see the specific documents and category of documents requested. Um, and the request here from one side to the other is for any and all documents pertaining to any transaction made by the claimants or on the claimant's behalf involving security entitlements and Argent teen sovereign bonds from a certain date and so on and so forth. Um, and then the fourth and fifth column in the middle of the slide include the arguments from that requesting party on the relevance and the materiality of these documents. So that's where the requesting party is making the arguments for why it should be entitled to an order from the tribunal to the other side for them to disclose these documents. And the way this works in practice is that at the time this request is made, the, re the remainder of the Redfern schedule is empty. So you would draft your request, you would explain the relevance and materiality, and then all of the columns to the right, so the claimant's response, reply, answer, and the tribunal's decision is blank at the beginning. You then exchange this with the other side, and they the party who is being requested to produce these documents will respond and they'll include their objections if they think that the documents aren't relevant or if they might be privileged. And it becomes a bit of an iterative process where then once those objections and responses are put in, it goes back to the requesting party um, and the columns get filled out from left to right. And then at the end of the process, it goes to the tribunal and they neatly have the party's arguments on this um, clearly set out in, in the same document. And you can see on the far right, the tribunal in this situation decided to grant uh, in part this request um, for disclosure. And one of the reason why I wanted to highlight this one, this particular request in this particular case is because this is the Redfern schedule from the Avoclat investment arbitration case. And this was a mass claim that initially involved 160,000, I believe, claimants. It was initially narrowed down um, to far less than that. I believe at one point it was 60,000, and I'm not sure ultimately where it ended up. Um, but I, I think that you can imagine if you were a lawyer for the claimants or several of the claimants, and the tribunal ordered the claimants, you know, perhaps tens of thousands of them, to disclose certain categories of documents, you were then going to have to go back with your client and search for and identify those documents and eventually go through a process to produce them to the other side. Um, but of course, when you go through that process, when you receive a huge quantity of documents, you don't simply take those documents and pass them through. Many of the documents your clients send you won't be relevant. Many of the documents your clients send to you might be privileged. And it would be a very challenging process to do that manually. So fortunately, there are many technologies that are commonly used today to help make that process much more seamless. I've included two examples here on the slide, Relativity and Disco, both in arbitration and litigation. These are commonly used tools to help um, the review process when you have large quantities of documents. And the basic setup for these resources is not all that complicated. You're able to see an electronic version of the document in the SNP here on the slide on the left. And then on the right, there are certain tags that you are able to add to the document. For example, one of the tags is for responsiveness. You're able to select whether a document is responsive or non-responsive. And then below that is a tag for privilege. And so if you have a large quantity of documents, you're able to have numerous people working in this database at the same time. You're able to divide the review of documents. You're able to flag questionable documents where you're not sure if it's responsive or privileged. Um, and so these tools make that process much easier. And so the, the first time is when you are, you've been ordered to produce documents from your own client to disclose them to the other side. And then of course the flip side is, 
when you are you receive a disclosure from the other side. And in a circumstance like this, it could have been thousands, if not tens of thousands of documents. And and these tools work just as um, are just as helpful on that end of the disclosure phase as well, because you'll need to tag documents for relevance for certain issues. You'll want to have a an organized process for identifying which documents are relevant to which claims. And these tools are extremely helpful um, for that. So the process that I've just described is, even though it's, it's using technology, is still a document by document, one lawyer going through each document sort of process. So it, th there are still some manual aspects to it. Um, but there will be cases, and this is um, becoming, I suppose, a bit more prominent in international arbitration, where the, the number of documents that the parties need to review are just too high, or perhaps the client doesn't have sufficient resources for a team of five or 10 lawyers to review tens of thousands of documents. And so there might be a decision to use what is called technology assisted review or TAR for short. And what TAR does is it uses predictive coding or machine learning review um, to develop algorithms. And what these algorithms allow you to do is prioritize documents based on relevance or perhaps privilege. And the way that this works, and you can see it um, here on the slide, is that it's a bit of an iterative process. And initially there is a, there's a training phase um, where once you've defined the review parameters and you've set a sort of basic review protocol, you will have humans, you'll have lawyers who are staffed on the case who are identifying for a small subset of documents, documents that are, say, responsive for particular issues or are pr privileged because of there is an, a, you know, an attorney by a particular name who is copied into the email. And what the, uh, the, the technology is able to do is, is able to develop an al algorithm based on numerous examples and numerous documents that you've clicked and then is able to use predictive coding to, after you've reviewed, say, 100 documents, to, for the remaining 1,000, say, documents, is able to implement its algorithm and to dramatically narrow the subset of documents that should be then reviewed for, um, again, by a human to check if they are relevant or responsive or privilege, whatever it might be. And it, it becomes an iterative process because when this the way this tool is most effective is if there are a few iterations of human review and followed by allowing the algorithm um, to narrow the field of documents. And this can help turn what might have taken hundreds of human hours into something that become, becomes a much more um, manageable process. And, and, and in short, the way that it works is human reviewers provide feedback on the accuracy of predictions and are able to identify documents that are classified correctly or misclassified. And the machine learns through various iterations of human interactions. And this, of course, can be extremely helpful and uh, efficient when you're given tens of thousands or perhaps even hundreds of thousands of documents. And it, it allows you know, for a much, much more efficient route through that process. And then I think I was going to hand it back to Maxi, who will be discussing some of the issues that have come up with remote hearings. Unless there are any questions on e-discovery, I know there are, often are because people are particularly interested in that. Feel free to ask him now, otherwise we also have some time at the end, but um, we're happy to, to take questions. So on the, um, on the next slide, we already talked a little bit about remote hearings and the fact that they have become really prominent since the pandemic. And luckily in a way for that aspect, the pandemic happened because it was a paradigm shift for the whole arbitration community to get into that space. Um, but even today, of course, um, this, you know, 
step has been taken and, and continues to be taken. Um, you see a lot of the rules now specifically refer to the fact that um, hearings can be done remotely by video conferencing. Um, this is due because during the pandemic, there was a bit of discussion as to whether or not a remote hearing is a hearing. Eventually, everyone agrees that, of course, it is the case as long as, you know, there is a proper interaction um, between people. Now, today, um, for most smaller hearings and procedural hearings, we still do them by video. Um, I have not had any case management conference, first case management conference that um, is in person since the pandemic. Um, however, when it comes to the merits hearing at the end, in particularly in larger cases, we are mostly back to a form of in-person hearing, but I have to say rarely without a portion that is not done remotely. So there is always a bit of hybrid, um, even today in most hearings. And that is, you know, if one uh, witness uh, all of a sudden has a problem with a visa and can't attend in person, well, that's not a problem or it might, it might be a problem, but at least there's a backup solution where we can hear them uh, remotely. Um, you might also just say for cost reasons, if someone is only going to be cross-examined for 15 minutes, it doesn't necessarily, you know, require flying around the world and paying a hotel, et cetera, et cetera. I just saw that there was a comment on the chat. Let me open this. Is there a preference by arbitrators or institutions in relating to the use of specific remote technologies and why security, privacy, et cetera? That's an excellent question. Um, there was a, you know, uh, you can you can probably go from a, a fairly basic just Zoom meeting, um, similar to the ones we do now, to very high end um, uh, um, providers um, who can help you with everything in 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 a remote hearing. So it depends on your preferences, but it frankly also depends on how much money parties are prepared to pay because this is eventually the costs that the parties will have to bear. So from an arbitrator's perspective, of course, the higher end, the better, because that then it is seamless, um, et cetera. And um, there is one on the next slide, I think uh, just one example of, a, I think actually one of the most advanced, I don't want to make any advertisement, but Opus 2 is really one of the most advanced uh, technologies when it comes to um, hearing, remote hearings, because they integrate often an electronic hearing bundle, translations, and court reporting. And I, I was about to touch these two other um, uh, uh, aspects of, of remote hearings as well. Well, so remote hearing is one thing. So if everything is fully remote, um, uh, but that, as I said, in, in big cases, at least these days is rare. But even if you have an in-person, you know, the parties, council, and the arbitrators coming together in person, there is still very often an aspect that is today done electronically. So for instance, um, if Opus does the electronic bundle, all you need to say is, can you please put exhibit R17 on the slide? And then poof, that's going to happen. And they often are not with you in the hearing room. They sit remotely somewhere entirely different, somewhere else in the world. Um, and then you can say, oh, can you please zoom in? And can you please highlight that? And so in a cross-examination or even in tribunal questions, that's a, it's a very helpful tool even in in-person hearings. Um, and so there, there are quite a few you know, aspects of how um, documents are presented, how exhibits and visual aids are presented that are done um, electronically. There is also the possibility of having translation or interpretation rather um, done um, remotely. So there are two versions of that. Either there is actually a person who is not with you in the room, but remotely somewhere and who does the interpretation. 
Uh, so if, if one, you know, one of the witnesses speaks in his or her own uh, native language and it needs to be translated or interpreted, say, in English, um, that is done remotely by a physical human person. There is, of course, also the possibility, I've never seen it, but I think it's just a matter of time um, that we also use trans well, interpretation that is done by AI, just as much as um, text is nowadays translated absolutely, as I said earlier, almost spotless, um, you could also have the translation of oral um, arguments. Uh, I've never seen it. And I probably would say I would be reluctant from a tribunal's perspective to do so in a cross-examination just because every word counts. And so sometimes there are misunderstandings. And I just had recently a case where it went, you know, one of the witnesses went totally, uh, uh, was very upset because there was one word he misunderstood and he you know, took offense and no one understood why he took offense, but it was there was one misunderstanding in the interpretation. Um, however, what we also often see, specifically in sort of cases involving states, where the state representatives are there and they just want to follow the hearings in their own native language. And so you have interpretation um, real live interpretation, but really just for the people to sort of sit in and not necessarily follow it in English. And I think there it would be much more cost, cost effective to have, you know, uh, um, uh, AI translation, even if there's one word from time to time that is not 100% correct, you, you get the general sense of it. Um, it's a bit like, you know, if you, you know, have a film uh, in a foreign language and you have a proper, um, you know, uh, what's it called? The stuff underneath? Subtitles. Subtitles, thank you. So, um, and um, I, I have to say, I've had classes at um, Queen Mary where we did um, things remotely and there is now a function within Zoom that it actually immediately gives you the subtitles, a bit like a transcript, um, and it works actually quite amazingly. Not 100%, but quite amazingly. Even in a class where, um, I see one, one of my students is actually here, Julia, hello, um, good to see you. And so we have a class where people come from all around the world, and so, you know, have different accents in English. And even with that, this, you know, transcription service, um, works pretty well. So my prediction is um, that translation and code reporting in a fairly, you know, uh, near future will be done by AI as opposed to by um, humans. I would not recommend anyone to become a code reporter today. Um, the existing code reporters, I think, are safe and they're excellent. Um, and we still will probably need some, but I don't think it's necessarily the best um, job choice um, for the future, I would say. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, we are actually going to move into a different topic, which is the award. So we're now at the end of the uh, of the of uh, an arbitration and the award is being drafted um, and there is also quite a bit of a question to what extent AI can help here. Um, the first point I want to talk about is to what extent it is possible. This is not so much AI, but just technology. Um, to what extent it is possible to sign an award electronically? So I have to tell you, this was one of the most surreal examples um, during the pandemic where, you know, we all had these, you know, remote hearings, video hearings, and everyone was being modern. And then all of a sudden, I was asked to come to the ICC in Paris to sign an award, wet ink. And because of the particular place of arbitration somewhere in the Middle East, every single page. So this was a 400 page award. Um, you needed, I don't know, five copies for the different parties. And so here I was signing, I don't know how many pages. It took me hours signing, 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 signing. 
And I mean, we are living in a world where technology is all around us and we still sign awards with wet ink. I mean, come on. Um, but somehow we don't get our act together. And the reason maybe is because some of the texts, um, legal texts that are in the legal sphere that we use, and you have here the New York Convention and the Unstral Model Law on the slide, refer to a signature. And then people might say, well, that means wet ink signature. Or like the New York Convention, they refer to a duly authenticated original or a certified copy. So what does that mean? Authentication actually means that the signature in the original is um, attested to be genuine. Uh, and a certified copy means that the copy actually is um, attested to be a true copy of the original, right? I don't think there is any um, barrier to say that an authenticated original award is one that has an electronic signature. Because in a way, an electronic, proper electronic, electronic signature is much easier to authenticate that this is really my signature than a wedding signature. You know, someone might have put a wedding signature that resembles mine and you need to then go to an expert and have some, you know, expertise on whether or not this is my signature or not. A proper electronic signature with, um, and we're going to come back in a moment what that is, is probably quite easy to authenticate, to be, you know, can be authenticated much better than a wedding signature. But the fact is that today I have never signed an electro and an award only electronically. The parties will always also ask um, for a hard copy. Now, we're trying to move away from this, and the next slide has um, some um, attempts to do so. Uh, sorry, one more. Um, I'm not going to talk about this one. Um, so we have the um, exit rules that say that it might be um, signed electronically. And the LCA rules go one step further because they say it might be signed electronically um, unless the parties agree otherwise. So in one case, sorry, the exit say if the parties agree, it might be signed um, electronically. And for the LCA, it's the other way around. It can be signed electronically unless the parties basically say otherwise. So, you know, there is a push towards electronic signatures, um, but there is still a, quite a bit of reluctancy as far as I can see from the arbitration community. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't really um, have that reluctancy because, as I said, there are, you know, ways of using multi-factor authentication of signatures that are um, uh, possible. Um, I was just being made aware um, this week that the um, German legislator who was, you know, thinking about um, reforming its arbitration law wants to put in also in the in the law a provision on electronic signature. So hopefully we will see um, electronic signatures and no more wet ink signatures in, in the years to come. But I also have to say, I do understand the parties who say, well, we've been just through this proceeding. It lasted for months. It lasted for years. We spent all this huge amount of money for arbitration and we don't want to risk now just because we don't sign the award in wet ink. So today I do understand that there is still, in case of doubt, um, uh, the parties push for wet ink signatures. But I do hope that by clarifying legislation, by clarifying what the New York Convention means, um, we will be able to have um, a shift in this in the years to come. Now, um, we are moving now into a different topic, which is maybe the most controversial one. Um, so we've looked at different types of technologies. Um, but before we do that, we wanted to have another another uh, a question to you. And that is, well, so the topic is um, 
legal decision making. So we've looked at different types of technology for legal research, for drafting, for submitting files, for using files in the hearing, etc. Now we're going to the real core of international arbitration, that is at the actual legal decision making. To what extent should AI be used for the actual legal decision making? Um, why or why not? What do you think? Should we use it? Should we not use it? This is for an arbitrator to actually make a decision to say liable, not liable, or you know, damages, no damages. Sergey, yes, please. Thank you. Um, well, uh, my answer is sh sh shortly yes. Uh, if you uh, think about what does it mean to use uh, artificial intelligence, is uh, I, I would say it's simple. You can use just one more assistant in 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 your job in, in your drafting and so on. So, what is the difference between a draft prepared by your uh, assistant, a human being, or a draft prepared by artificial intelligence? You ha have just uh, make a choice, next choice, which one is uh, better. So there is no uh, reason to refuse uh, to, to use artificial intelligence in a word drafting, for example. So. Um, Arbitrator would get uh, just maybe wider, wider choice of options, uh, wider choice of arguments, wider choice of uh, practices, and so on uh, to be implemented into final final award. So, I believe it's it's good to have one one more instrument uh, to get uh, a draft, for example. Can I ask you a follow-up question then? Um, yep. If I use a tribunal secretary that helps me preparing, you know, procedural orders, helps me with filing of exhibits, etc., I need to tell the parties. Um, so I need to say, I don't know, Russell's is helping me on this case, and Russell's is also signing a declaration of impartiality and independence, and in under some rules. I even need to say what types of tasks I would ask Russell to do so that I'm not delegating my actual decision-making power, which of course is only for the arbitrators. So would you say the same thing for AI? Would I need to disclose that I use AI and how I use AI? Maybe it's important procedural point. Uh... Maybe you should you should disclose this, but even you, you well, e even you are just working yourself. So uh, what 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 uh, what will be negative uh, influence if you just use uh, IE to combine a, a set of arguments to be used in your final work? What about and this is for everyone else. Um... Well, definitely math calculation for damages, maybe. This is a good point from the chat. Um, but what about the actual decision-making, right? So that not a human being, but a, an algorithm is telling you who wins and who loses in a case. So the actual core of the decision-making is made by a robot arbitrator. What do people think about that? No, we, we are still far from that. I I, I believe at, at this stage we're definitely not ready to uh, to support the idea that uh, some robot will will, will produce a fi final award. I'm talking just uh, on a preparatory uh, stage on uh, some uh, combination of uh, uh, arguments, combination of uh, uh, court practices, judgments, which can be used uh, in your final award. So. My point is that uh, we are not uh, we are, we are still far from a final award making by by robot. So uh, arbitrator is a final uh, final point of producing uh, an award or any procedural uh, document. But preparatory stage can be supported by AI. Do other people share that skepticism? I take silence as a yes. <laughs> well, you might be surprised. Um, and, and 
the Sergei's answer is is exactly what people usually say. Um, um, that well, there are you know preparation, but the actual decision making, the arbitrator is an AI, a you know computer program is just not up for the job, um, because it's such a complicated cognitive process to understand the party's submissions and to make a decision. And fair enough, it is complicated. But there are actually quite some interesting studies that show that um, computer programs algorithms outperform human experts in predicting the outcome of a case. So if I ask you at the beginning of an arbitration, um, you know, who will win? Will party A win or will party B win? And I ask this question to a number of arbitration specialists, you know, this group, uh, uh, eminent um, colleagues around the world, humans. Um, and I ask the same question to a computer program. It's not clear who will get the correct answer in terms of, you know, probabilities. I'm just looking at the chat because I saw there's another. <clears throat> So we have, sorry, um, uh, we have Valeri said in simple cases, we can use AI if we have a special algorithm. And Catalina said, uh, no, um, if yes, that will destroy all the magic of legal representation. And that's of course true, uh, but we might not want it, but we might be replaced. But the question is, will we be replaced? So. These studies, um, and there is a first study, which is not here on the slide, which was done in the US where a group of, you know, lawyers and law professors were asked to predict the outcome of the Supreme Court decisions of that particular year. And there was an algorithm who also predicted um, the outcome. And, uh, you know, the lawyers and prominent uh, professors and everyone, they got it right in 59% of the cases, and the um, computer model got it right in 75% of the cases. So there's a significant um, increase in the probability or uh, correctness of the, of the prediction um, of the computer model. And what I would also say that, you know, the lawyers and, 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 and prominent law professors only got it right in 59% of the cases, which is just slightly more then if you flip a coin where you have a chance of 50% to get it right, your prediction. Um, there are two more sophisticated studies which are here on the slide. The first one, which is the one at the bottom of your slide is from 2016 and looked at decisions from the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and here, the lawyers um, use, you know, uh, put together a computer program and then a little bit like what uh, Russell's explained with the supervised training of um, the e-discovery here as well, they trained the algorithm was a subset um, of European Court um, of Human Rights decisions. So with about 10% of the data, they trained the algorithm. And then for the remainder of the data, the 90%, they asked the algorithm to predict the outcome um, and the computer program got it right in almost 80% of the cases. And there's the other study, which is here, the top one on the slide, which is about the US Supreme Court. And this was a very ambitious study because it looked at um, data from 1816 to 2015, so almost 100 years of US Supreme Court decisions. And that was the data set with which um, the model was trained. And the model was asked to predict the outcome of the individual votes of the justices, because in the US, they all say what they think individually, and of the court altogether. And so for the individual justices, the accuracy was 71.9%, uh, so almost 72%. And the outcome of the decision as such was just above 70%. These are all fairly high numbers. 
Now, I've looked into these studies quite a bit in detail, and I think there are some reasons why you cannot necessarily translate them into predictions in real life for international arbitration or any other first instance court decision. There is no, um, there is a reason why all of these are at the highest level, Supreme Court or European Court of Justice, because there's only a binary outcome. You know, either uh, uh, the case is dismissed or uh, or not, but there isn't anything else. Um, and, you know, if you're interested, I can send you my papers on this. I don't want to go into too much detail here. But nevertheless, they, these numbers are quite, quite astonishing. Um, but there are reasons why, in arbitration at least, um, the um, use of these types of computer models might not be available tomorrow. One is that these computer models are extremely data hungry. Um, so the more data you have, the better is the accuracy of the prediction. Uh, so if you have only a small data set, your uh, prediction will go, you know, will be quite uh, inaccurate. And the problem of course, is that in commercial arbitration, at least, um, awards are typically confidential and therefore you just don't have access to the data uh, as much as you would like to. And here are just some examples of, of rules around the world that say that awards are typically not published. Now, there are more and more initiatives to incentivize the parties to agree to publish awards. The ICC is really trying to do that quite a bit. Um, and one could even imagine that data that the arbitration institutions have is used to train a model without breaching necessarily the confidentiality of the award. So maybe there are ways around this first hurdle, which is the data you know, scarcity um, in, in commercial arbitration. And maybe the same doesn't apply in, um, as much in investor state arbitration where um, most awards are public but then the number of awards in investor state arbitration is comparatively much smaller than in commercial arbitration where you have a lot more awards. The other um, a problem, and this is um, on the next slide, is that very often these well, prediction models and the data uh, um, models are infected by biases. You will all have heard about um, the fact that AI models, and I'm not talking about arbitration here, but generally um, are infected by um, all sorts of biases. I just heard in the on the radio this morning uh, another example where a computer firm used AI to select CVs of, for their developers, and the um, AI only selected men because they thought that women weren't up for being computer developers. Um, and there are tons of examples for, you know, racial biases, gender biases, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason, of course, is that all of these models are based on data in which humans have shown certain biases. So if there is a human bias in the data, well, it will show in the prediction um, and in the outcome and the output of the algorithm. So there's, there's a risk of systemic mistakes. Now, you might say, but what has this to do with international arbitration? Who cares about these biases? Well, think about the criticism that has been leveled, for instance, um, and Julia, we talked about this in class not so long ago, um, about um, criticism that has been leveled against investment treaty arbitration. Um, some people say that it is inherently favoring investors against respondent states. I don't wanna take any views here. I'm not saying that that is the case. Let's assume for the you know purpose of the exercise, let's assume that is the case. Let's assume hypothetically, that such a bias exists in the past awards um, uh, that have been fed into an algorithm. If that is the case, then the algorithm necessarily 
will perpetuate that bias and continue and probably even um, uh, enforce the bias and um, uh, continue to uh, decide in favor of investors against state interest. That's just an example how inherent substantive biases might also be of um, uh, you know, interest in, in this discussion. And then um, the last slide, I think, is um, what at the time when I wrote this article, I thought was the most prominent hurdle for AI. And that is um, the fact that legal decisions need to be reasoned. That's one of the fundamental principles of you know, any rule of law based country that deci decisions are reasoned. And um, AI so far has been unable um, to provide reasons, even so much so that for some of these, you know, very sophisticated AI models, there is what one calls the black box problem. So that even the computer programmers, even the, you know, the, the researchers who have developed the program have no idea how a certain outcome is reached. So how a self-learning algorithm has reached a certain conclusion is certain, sometimes not necessarily, um, cannot be replicated, cannot be understood, even by the, by the computer scientists who have developed that program, because it's in a black box. That's the, where the name comes from. So sometimes you get a good prediction, but you have no clue why that prediction is accurate and how the algorithm came to that particular um, prediction. But that's precisely what we typically want in, an, in a decision is to tell us why you have come to a certain um, outcome. Um, because providing reasons is you know, fundamental for, for justice. The losing party wants to know why it lost. Um, other parties might want to, you know, adapt their behavior in the future, and other tribunals um, or, you know, decision makers might want to look at the decision and say, okay, I agree with it, or I don't. Uh, all of that requires that a decision is reasoned. Now, I think that is still the case that these prediction models are unable to provide reasons why they came to a certain prediction other than potentially statistical or probabilistic analysis. So this will be something that isn't really a reason that helps uh, human addressee to understand. But I could imagine, and this is totally you know, for the future, that you have on the one hand an AI model that predicts the outcome based on one algorithm. And then you have a sort of chat GBT type large language model that invents reasons that are most probable for a human to understand for that particular outcome. So one is to say the outcome is X and the other one is to say, I formulate reasons that are understandable, intelligible, and you know, uh, hopefully uh, uh, agreeable to a human addressee of that decision. That is very much in the future, but that's um, a possible combination of you know, the prediction tools that we have and the lang uh, large language models that we have. I'm not saying that's a good idea, and I'm not saying we're going to see that tomorrow, but it's, it's a possibility. Um, Russell, do you want to do the next slide and final question, I think? Sure, I'd be happy to. So we wanted to go um, from the discussion we were just having on legal decision making to a slightly different but related subject, um, which is whether you think AI will level the playing field by making access to justice more affordable or if it will make the current d divide that exists um, in the legal community even worse than it is um, at the current moment. 
So of course, on the one hand, AI is a powerful tool, um, but what effect do you think it will have in terms of equity, in terms of the ability of some but not others to have access to justice? We're curious to hear your thoughts. So I see Sophia's hand is raised. You're, you're, you're welcome to jump in. Um, I would say that probably AI will make justice more affordable since arbitration is quite expensive process. And there is a lot of expenses, which include not just an arbitration itself, but also the hotel for witnesses, for experts, for arbitrators itself, the plane tickets if needed, et cetera, et cetera. AI will just uh, demolish all this, um, uh, all these payments and at least this part will make it even more affordable. And uh, again, I think the work of arbitrator itself is more payable rather than AI. Um, so probably that could be also an issue why the AI could be more affordable for uh, more people. Yeah, I think that's a, a great answer. There are definitely ways that technology can be used to make dispute resolution much more affordable to parties. And hopefully that will allow um, better access to justice so that at the outset, there of course has to be a consideration of, is it worth it? And if you're running that analysis and you're thinking it's gonna be millions and millions of dollars to arbitrate this dispute, I'm gonna to have to hire these fancy lawyers and then even fancier arbitrators like Maxi who, who charge an arm and a leg. Um, that, hang on, that... hang on, hang on. Counsel are more expensive than our retreat, just for the record. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, that, that can be a, a serious concern. And hopefully many of these technologies um, that we've discussed today do reduce many of the cost barriers. Um, so that, that's definitely one consideration there. I, I see Sergey's hand was raised. Um, did you have a, a follow-up point? Uh, actually, I would support the, the point made by Sophia. Uh, uh, I would say the same that uh, IE development will uh, positively influence the affordability of justice in, in terms of costs. And uh, I would also just uh, mm -hmm. say uh, the famous phrase uh, that uh, delayed ju justice is denied justice. So uh, I would say that uh, AI would definitely make uh, justice more speedy, maybe. So uh, the parties will get the result of justice uh, in more timely manner. So it will heavily influence their ability to protect their rights. I, 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 I would agree with that. Um, and when Maxi and I were thinking about um, some of the points we wanted to discuss on this. Uh, one, one of the technologies I noted um, in our initial conversations was about drafting the initial um, part of many wards, which is going through the procedural history of a case. And Maxi left a comment asking about what technologies currently exist for that. And m many of my colleagues at the firm that I work with are tribunal secretaries for Maxi. And I know that can be a pretty labor intensive task. And so even just having a tool that can automate that could be a pretty powerful way to, to your point, Sergey, to ho hopefully make the process of reaching a, a final decision on a case much more efficient so that there is not uh, just I, I would delayed. add maybe, sorry, I would add maybe that uh, I'm not talking just about the arbitration stage, for example, the, the job of arbitrators or the job of uh, uh, secretaries of arbitration institution. I would, I would say about also about the, Preparation, preparation job of attorneys uh, who are preparing the, the, the files. Attorneys are uh, extremely expensive uh, for the party. So it is also the stage at, at which uh, justice uh, would be made more accessible. I think you're exactly right. So th those are very helpful. I'm not, I don't think we had any further comments on the chat. Maxi, did you 
have any there points you wanted one. to make? Okay. Um, I can't remember if this was, I think it was right now. Yes. Um, uh, Sergey, another Sergey, um, said, I'd rather buy a human rendered justice. Well, you don't really buy the arbitrators, but anyway, I think you get, you know, I, we got your point. Um, as it relies more on inner conviction and a sort of challenge between parties, it is doubtful to change the mind of AI. Um, and that's actually, I think, an excellent comment where a lot of people say, you know, I want to have this human link with the arbitrators. I want to have this empathy from a human that when I tell the arbitrator, you know, I look her in the eye and sort of present my case, I hope that I can touch, um, you know, her inner conviction, legal conviction, of course, but still. Um, uh, and that's that's where uh, a lot of people are doubtful about um, the use of AI. Can I just, um, on, on the level playing field, for me, this is the $100 million question going forward, whether AI will become a tool that makes arbitration a better place. And I can see that happening for all the reasons that you've mentioned, it's gonna be less costly. And you can also dream big, right? You could dream a world where people could speak in their different languages and it would be immediately you know, interpreted. So everyone could plead in any language. There wouldn't be any language barriers anymore. Um, so even people who didn't have the chance to whatever, for whatever reason, um, learn a foreign language, they could still be international arbitration practitioners just like anyone else. Um, on the other hand, and I think there is a risk that AI will be used to concentrate existing powers. And that's, you know, if you think about how some, you know, there was the example of law firms, you know, big, you know, uh, Anglo-American law firms using AI tailor-made uh, for their own purposes. I know that some firms have already said, you know, we can use uh, document production, we can do this much cheaper than any of our colleagues. So the fact that you do have that leverage as a firm to be able to not just use AI that's publicly available, but to get it tailor-made for your own needs um, is something that could potentially even be a, you know, a, a, um, an engine that creates even more uh, inequalities in arbitration where people from less developed um, jurisdiction in international arbitration find it harder to go into the market. And that's why I think for me, this is the $100 million question and why we need to get this right so that it is hopefully going in the right direction and not in the wrong direction. Personally, I think that would be wonderful. Sorry, uh, Russell, you, you want to continue? Of course. And so th this final section, we, we we wanted to conclude with exactly what Maxi was just saying, which is what are the considerations we need to bear in mind in order to make sure that we get this right? Um, and so the, the first area that the first implication is really to make sure um, that AI tools and other new developing technologies are are used in a way that still complies with lawyers' ethical obligations, their duties of care, competence, um, and confident, confidentiality with their clients. Um, because as lawyers increasingly rely on AI-powered tools for tasks like document review and case analysis, um, it's critical that lawyers ensure that these systems adequately protect client information. Um, so this involves assessing the security measures implemented by AI vendors, understanding how client data is stored and processed if you are using various technologies and mitigating risk associated with potential data breaches or even un unauthorized access to databases where you're storing confidential um, client information. Um, and so numerous courts uh, in the UK, the USA, Canada have issued rulings or standing orders on the use of certain technologies. And of course, um, the focus of late has been on the use of AI and generative AI, AI such as chat GPT in the courtroom. The, the trend amongst those standing orders and rulings tend to be that uh, the courts are placing the onus of responsibility on the attorney to notify 
the court of the use of such AI. Um, and typically courts are requiring that the attorney review and confirm the accuracy of the work done by AI. I believe one of the comments earlier was, sure, you could use AI um, to help with legal research, but the lawyer always needs to go um, back afterwards and double check and confirm that everything is true. And that very much has been at least the approach so far for most courts who have issued guidance or even standing orders on how AI can used or not be used. And th this quote here on the slide, I, I think is particularly helpful um, in, in the way it frames the issue, which this is from a judge in a United States district court in, in Texas. And he says the AI platforms are incredibly powerful and have many uses in the law. They include several examples there, but then he says, but legal briefing is not one of them. Here's why. These platforms in their current status are prone to hallucinations and bias. They make stuff up, even quotes and cita citations. Another issue is re reliability or bias. While attorneys swear an oath to set aside their personal prejudices, biases, and beliefs to faithfully uphold the law and represent their clients, generative AI is the product of programming devised by humans who did not have to swear such an oath. So th these are very, very real concerns that courts are dealing with um, every single day. Some courts are taking much more of a um, activist approach and are issuing orders specifically on it. And the question, therefore, is, I, I would say, is whether arbitral institutions and whether arbitration ought to do the same. Um, currently, most institutional rules um, provide either little or no guidance with respect to AI, how it can be used, whether, as Maxi was mentioning earlier, um, whether need whether the use of it needs to be disclosed. There, there's typically, in most institutional rules, almost nothing said directly about AI. There, there has been um, increased efforts of late um, to address this issue, though. Um, the Silicon Valley Arbitration and Mediation Center so one particular arbitral institution has published draft guidelines um, concerning AI's use in arbitration. Uh, this is still very much a work in progress. There, are, uh, the this particular institution is still fielding comments. So this is a hot button issue of late, and you know the, the decisions are being made now on how AI should or should not be regulated in international arbitration. With these particular guidelines, draft guidelines, I should say, um, some of the major focuses are promoting um, understanding of AI's limitations, um, the risks that go with it, safeguarding confidentiality, ensuring competent and diligent use of AI, and ensuring arbitrators do not delegate their decision-making responsibilities. So we were just, Maxi was just explaining, you know, the various reasons why there are still serious limitations about legal decision-making um, being made by AI. And this is exactly what these rules, um, or rather these guidelines are exploring. So we've discussed many of the powerful ways that technology and in particular AI change and might continue to change uh, international arbitration. It's still an open question of how and when arbitrators should rely on th those tools. These guidelines are an attempt to offer some sort of uniform approach to that, uh, but it's still very much a work in progress. And then I'll turn it over to Maxi for the last few slides. Yes, thank you. And um, maybe just uh, linking it back to a question I put to Sergi uh, earlier on, would you need to disclose that you use AI um, if you use it as an arbitrator? Um, the Silicon Valley um, guidelines um, actually have tried to tackle that, but so far um, haven't really made a clear decision. There are two options in the draft guidelines. Uh, one is a bit more vague that sort of says you may consider in certain circumstances and so forth and so on. Um, and another one that is a bit more affirmative that there is an obligation to disclose. 
my personal opinion is that uh, the problem is not so much about whether you need to or have an obligation to disclose or not. In my view, the definition, the, the problem lies with the definition of AI. Um, and the way AI is defined in these guidelines is, is very broad. I actually just looked at it here on my other screen. It says AI refers to computer systems that perform tasks commonly associated with human cognition, such as understanding natural language, recognizing complex semantic patterns, and generating human-like outputs. That's a pretty broad definition. And so if you say you need to disclose the use of AI, boy, I need to tell them that I'm using you know, Outlook, um, because Outlook is probably using some form of AI to go through my spam or a Google search. Um, so clearly, that's not the purpose of the disclosure exercise. So um, what exactly you need to disclose and what you don't need to disclose in terms of AI is still very much, um, I think, a gray zone. And that's the difficulty um, that these guidelines um, certainly grapple with. Now, I'm mindful of time and we want to have a time for questions. So very briefly, only on the next slide, we have said that there are also some data privacy issues that one needs to be aware of, sort of, you know, using AI and certain AI systems could be potentially clashing with certain national requirements of data um, privacy here, Article 22 of the um, European regulation, the GDPR, um, has been set to potentially create issues because it says that everyone has the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling. So some people have asked, so does that mean you can't have a you know AI-based decision? I'm not quite sure that's right because it says solely based, and I think no one really um, is, you know, that's a bit ahead of the curve, really. Um, and the last slide is really a, a summary of what we've already discussed in answer to your very valid comments on the question earlier, to what extent AI can improve access to justice by removing barriers, by removing uh, costs, and time restrictions in, in particular, um, but also the fact, as we've said, um, that, um, you know, while GBT is free, the enhanced versions uh, might not be. And so if you have a tailor-made, more expensive version, that in, in and of itself does not necessarily mean you improve access um, to justice. Um, I'm gonna maybe close on, one of the questions I get from younger colleagues quite a bit or, or students will say, you know, does this mean that some of our work that we would have done as young lawyers will be taken away from us is, is basically, is AI taking our jobs? And there is a lot of discussion, as you can see here from um, the clippings, and these are press clippings um, on the slide. Um, my personal conviction is that it won't take away our jobs. It will significantly change the way we do our jobs. And I very much like the quote um, that is by um, Richard Baldwin, an economist who say, AI won't take your job, but someone who knows how to use it will. Um, and so part of, um, I guess, legal education of, of younger generations is to make sure that people are tech savvy, know how to use AI to the best of, uh, of their, uh, uh, to the best possible way. And that means not relying on it blindly for all the reasons that we've discussed, but uh, knowing what's out there and knowing um, how to use it. So with that, um, I think we wanna keep a little bit of time uh, for questions, but I, don't want to close without, well, thanking Russell for joining me in, in this lecture. It's been a pleasure. But also our other colleague, Maxwell, who is joining us um, in the audience um, and who has put together all these wonderful slides. This was not done by ChatGPT, um, but by our wonderful colleague, uh, Maxwell, who is here with us today. So thank you to you as well. Um, Olena, um, I don't know if you want to 
open the floor for questions. We are happy to take questions, even though we did ask and, and went through a lot of the comments as we, uh, so as we I, I went through the lecture. I could only like, ask again if anyone who have, <laughs> has any questions, because I have seen that uh, you, you have a quite interactive uh, lecture. So if yes, so please uh, raise your hand or write a comment in a chat box. box. If not, I would like to thank our wonderful speakers for today's lecture. Indeed, uh, the topic gives a lot of food for thought. And if you're thinking about the future of legal profession and how this could change in, in very nearest future, in fact, because what how the, the speed of development of chat DVT is just fascinating. And nobody, almost nobody predicted <laughs> a couple of years ago that so uh it's, it's indeed interesting uh, topic and uh it's um influence on the arbitration is would be great as well so i see just a moment oh no it's no yeah so uh, uh then uh thank you to our speakers and a small announcement to our participants so as i mentioned it is it was our last lecture so with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for attending uh, our two modules. And I would like to remind you that those who have uh, attended at least 80% of the first module, at least three lectures of the second module will receive a certificate. We will need a, a bit of time to calculate everything and to prepare and send it to you. And we will also ask you to complete the feedback forms uh, because it's very important for us to understand it was a new format new lectures, uh, new topics. So we really need to understand uh, whether we could improve it and what was good, what was not so good, et cetera, et cetera. So we, I, we would ask you to complete them as well. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, so you know how to, <laughs> to, to contact us. And uh, uh, so thank you again, everyone. Uh, uh, it was a great journey, uh, which was more than three months long, but uh, indeed very, very interesting. So thank you very much for everyone. With this, I am closing the Arbitration Academy of Ukrainian Arbitration Association and hope to see you in our other events. So bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye and thank you very much.